and match podcast the place where we bring together the art inspired by the music and the music inspired by the art we'll introduce you to creators of all kinds who draw inspiration from music in some cases there will be writers and in others painters potters glass blowers doctors nurses mechanics and maybe even a cobbler or two in short they'll be members of our tribe artisans creators and people from all walks of life who connect with music we asked each guest to create a playlist around any theme they want, which we link to in the show notes. During our conversation, we'll go through each song. Because where there is music, there is inspiration. Welcome to Mix and Match. Thank you for joining us. What, what would you say you do here? Let's just start my first question. Tell us a little bit about who you are. I'm Charles. Cardello um, was born in Eastern North Carolina in 1975, <laughs> where I was kind of a fish out of water. Hmm. And uh, my parents moved there from New York, New oh, wow. Northern New Jersey. And they moved there, I well, for a number of reasons but they could buy a house for really cheap there compared to up north um but they were you know they were complete northerners you know like they were they were city folks and they moved to a place where i don't think the road we lived on was paved until i was like eight or nine wow there were neighbors without running water and stuff you know it's like really countryfied type place where they moved. They moved to a place called Nashville, North Carolina, which is about probably an hour and a half from the coast. What led the move? What, how do you, move, how do you go from New York, New Jersey area to well, we could do a whole podcast on that? <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> my dad's history, but like, um, well, I believe they had a cousin who had moved there and he, um, they visited him around that time. I think my dad, someone burned down my dad's business and they just got the heck out of Dodge and bought a house in the middle of nowhere where I was born and grew up. I mean, we still went back up North a few times a year. And my dad was a truck driver for a company in New Jersey. Okay. So we spent a lot of time up North when I was a little bit, but my surroundings were like, really rural um southern uh, you know poor surroundings where i grew up now you said you uh were a fish out of water how did how, how, i mean outside of being a northeasterner born down there but uh how so well i mean the culture especially at the time probably still now where i just went back to my grandmother's funeral like two weeks ago oh, i'm sorry 202 so don't be sorry oh, okay. <laughs> like <laughs> she made it to 102 i'm sorry i don't mean to laugh she was she was glad to go but anyway the, um well i was a spaz you know i was kind of like you know undiagnosed adhd i wasn't i didn't have patience for like hunting and fishing and i don't know i i just wasn't like a Southern boy. Uh, somehow I was just a city boy from birth. Um, I liked concrete and skateboarding and BMX and weird stuff like soccer. And, you know, I tried to play baseball, but I, I could hit, but I was scared to get hit by the pitch, you know, and, 
you know, I got my ass kicked by all the redneck kids and, you know, it, it just didn't work out for me <laughs> as, as like a Southern boy, you know, my, my, my kind of like my older brother character, you know, that lived across the yard, this guy, Jay, he was, you know, his parents were Southern and he fit right in. And I just, I just kind of like tried to emulate him and, you know, it didn't really work out. Then my parents sent me to Catholic school Oh God. for like eight years. So I was kind of insulated from the whole, like kind of Lord of the flies, um, Southern yeah. environment that, was public school out there but you know all my neighbors and the kids i grew up with and stuff were you know they didn't have as hard a time as i did i didn't feel like um so of course you know as i got older i gravitated toward weird stuff that kind of fit the mold you know like identity music Mm. Uh, we're around the same age it wasn't so easy to find this music back then it wasn't like you could pop something open i mean um a lot of a lot of the music on your playlist is stuff i've never heard of how did you find it i kind of had all the elements in place i think the the first stuff that really moved me was i remember seeing when i heard like early hip-hop like run dmc and that the death jam stuff hello cool j beastie boys like that stuff i liked the I liked the energy of it. And and I, it was the first music other than like, you know, like seventies and early eighties pop country that I heard on the radio. And I liked, it was the first music that I was like, okay, I immediately loved the way it sounded. It just like, first time I heard the song, I was just like, I don't know what this is. I don't know what you call this, but I love this. I need to hear this again. And I think, uh, it was around the time, like Yo MTV Raps came on. I think it was on Sunday for 30 minutes. Uh, and that was it. Um, and, you know, if you were, and I, you know, I started to get involved in BMX and skateboarding and stuff. And there was a tiny group of people who did those things in my area. And, you know, we all watched Yo MTV Raps. And at some point, that my philosophy video came on it was one of the first things I saw the boogie down productions and that video just, that was it. Like I saw that everything about that spoke to me. It just screamed like, this is music for the underdog spirit, you know, like, and, and I, um, I don't know. It, it just blew my mind. And from then this guy, Travis, moved down the street from us and he was like straight up like punk rock skate kid and um girls liked him girls did not, <laughs> girls did not like me at the time he was confident he was a really good artist he was a really good skateboarder and he had this huge like box of cassette tapes and he also liked hip hop um, which is the reason why I gave him a chance because I didn't like I kind of associated like rock music at that point in my little you know like 12 year old mind with like white people that I didn't like and rednecks and stuff which was stupid but he 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 also like he liked public enemy and he liked boogie down productions and he liked he liked hip-hop you know so and he also had all his punk stuff. And he uh, he turned me on to like, I think the first punk stuff that I gravitated toward was the stuff that had kind of a more of a poppy bounce that he dag nasty descendants stuff like that. I wasn't so much into like the abrasive stuff. I wasn't so much into hardcore at first. It was a little, it didn't quite like have the um, rhythm, the rhythmic bounce that like pulled me in. But then. Um, I think it was like ninth grade. He was driving to school. So I liked like de- like that, the poppy stuff. Right. Um, but then on the way to school, he would always play. I think it was, um, I think it was the youth are getting restless. The, the live bad brains record. I think it was recorded in Amsterdam, mm. but at some point that, t- that cassette tape ended up in the, the, the liner notes ended up in the back seat and I opened it and I was like, wait a minute, like, these are black dudes? Like, <laughs> I was just kind of like, whoa. 
So I was like, I'm, I better give these guys a chance. <laughs> and, and, you know, I eventually just through exposure and, you know, growing up or whatever, I started really getting involved in like hardcore and punk and most all, you know, my exposure was eighties, hardcore, bad brains, descendants, um, stuff like that. A lot of SST, um, mm. And then later, you know, the epitaph stuff, you know, right. late eighties, early nineties. Um, have you ever, have you ever seen the documentary about the band death? No, but I want to kind of like yeah. precursor, like the early, like when I hear stuff like death and bad brains, I'm like, where did they get this from? You know, right. there was no template. Like what were they thinking? <laughs> you know, it's like, how did this, how did they, how did they, conjure this up this music i mean they invented hardcore as far as i'm concerned it, it's wild that these four urban black dudes from outside of dc and death when well, they were from detroit right correct yeah these guys invented a whole new genre of music with when i think of american music you know you think of like country and jazz and then you think of like hardcore and you think of hip-hop and of all these genres, like it's weird that hardcore is one of the most endearing, like anything eighties hardcore that happens, people are on it. Like I, we do, you know, my company by focal media, we do a lot of like limited merch, artsy fartsy collaborations with bands and artists that are relative to the, the band visual artists that are relative to the bands in some way or another. and. Anything we do, like even the smallest bands that are like 80s hardcore, um, people freak out over it. You know, it's just endearing. And new kids like like young kids like it, like kids who are into like new bands, they want to know where it came from. So they love it. And people my age still love it. And people older than us, I'm close to 50, people older than us, like my close friend Brian Walsby who I just kind of started the shirt thing with, you know, he's still, it's very endearing to him and he's made a career out of his, you know, his connection to that. So it's mind blowing that this outsider music, this abrasive anti-pop music somehow became like this endearing American art form. To me, that's crazy. For sure. It's very crazy. For sure. And I think there's a parallel there between, between rap, hip hop, and punk, in that it's the genres that were created. I don't want to sound too nerdy, but almost out of thin air. They're, like you said, there's no template for this stuff. And these guys just pulled it down and made this new genre, which is really interesting. Especially hip hop, because if you think yeah. about it, it's like, all right, well, we're not playing instruments. We don't have all this gear. We don't have a space to practice this music. Let's just make let's just take records and make new songs out of old records. Let alone, let alone the, the, the socioeconomic restrictions that a lot of these guys were placed under, because if you look at it historically, well, I think, I think one of the most interesting things about the growth of hip hop is that it kind of languished for a little while. And then there were the riots, like the, uh, the power, the blackout riots where all this really nice gear got, ripped off from all these like nice music stores and with that equipment they made this like hip-hop what it became in like the late 80s and like it's funny i remember my uncle one time i don't know late 80s early 90s telling me like oh this music isn't going to be around in two years you know like one of these uncles that knows everything always like very loud and very wrong always. He's like, <laughs> um, like, this music isn't going to be around. And I was like, look, it's on TV. And he was like, oh yeah, everybody knows this. Like very like, uh, just dismissive. And I remember being so angry because I was like, this is going to take over. And I was yeah. right. I was right. And then recently he complained about how. It I'm not a huge hip hop guy or rap guy. I like some stuff to me on your playlist. And we'll get to your playlist. But one of the songs is from Paul's Boutique. Beastie Boys album, Paul's Boutique, which to me is the perfect form, a uh, perfect hip hop record that I know of. And I, my, my knowledge base is very limited, but 
I think like a tribe called quest, the BC boys, that era from like 88 to really like 91 is like the halcyon days of hip hop because the record companies and the songwriters and the publishers had not cracked the whip. Right. Like the BC boys could sample Zeppelin could sample. I think, I think all of a million dollars on samples for that record. And it, it will probably be unfathomable what, what oh, they'd yeah, have to pay today. Do it today. Because I mean, there's, it's, there's a lot of samples from the Beatles. Um, it, it's, yeah. You couldn't do that today. And they, they, they'll tell you that too. Those guys will tell you, you can't do it today, but you know, at the time when I heard it, I didn't I didn't know where those samples came from when that record came out. I bought it at the record store the day it came out. Um and uh I didn't I just thought this is these are Beastie Boys songs. <laughs> I didn't know yeah. that I didn't I didn't even know like the Led Zeppelin sample samples, you know, like I just wow. I, I didn't I just was like, Well, this is like this is the Beastie Boys made this. I knew it was sampled, but I didn't know the samples yet. So I only knew those songs as Beastie Boys songs, which okay. which is a unique approach. And I also didn't know at the time that the record wasn't a big like hit. You know, I didn't no. realize I didn't really have a like barometer for what was popular outside of my little bubble of weirdo friends. And all the all the kids I hung out with had that record, you know. Yeah. Like uh it was always at playing at the skate ramp. We skate ramp out in the country in the middle of nowhere that we built when we tore down my friend's parents' shed. But it was all like it was just always around. So I didn't know it was this music that, you know, wasn't around. For me, what always intrigued me is that it was such a pivot from license to ill. And I love it when bands do that and they do it successfully, like like they did. Such a radical pivot. Yeah, but it still was like it still had to, it had the same like energy as license to ill though to me like their vocal approach was so mm. intertwined and so busy that it, it still sounded like the beastie boys to me like i i do remember seeing the world premiere for the uh hey ladies video and being yeah i do <laughs> i remember and, and being kind of like i don't know about this song but then exactly then i i got the record and it was immediately like um immediately like after the there's like the to all the girls or whatever the intro thing it drops and it's like all right there it is and it was just it was straight up like boom bap hip-hop but it had all this lush busy like sampling like all these arrangements and they sampled really atmospheric music to make the record and they piled them up so it's just like this holy shit but somehow it's still just like totally catchy like it doesn't it doesn't devolve into chaos ever, like like you know, like the Public Enemy records did after that. Which I I kind of put like Nation of Millions and Paul's Boutique in the same like production boat because they're hmm. sort of the same approach, where you take all these insane samples and you make something totally new out of. The Public Enemy stuff was probably more punk or whatever in sure. uh, approach. It was more chaotic. But it had a bounce too. But but I you know at the time in what was it eighty nine when that came out, yeah. I just was like, I love this new Beastie Boys record. You know, I didn't uh, I didn't have these like, I wasn't thinking about it like a music critic <laughs> like I do yeah. now. Like when you look back on it, you're like, holy shit, this is an overwhelmingly dense and amazing piece of music. Like you just cannot. I don't think they did anything better than that. You know. I would be inclined to agree with you. I mean, I, I you know, check your head. It was okay. I mean, I like it for its time. Midnight when it came out because it had been so oh, nice. long since that. they had done a record. And yeah. by then, the only people who listened to Beastie Boys were like punks and skaters, and it seemed like. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, there were they had lost that whole like fret douche crowd that liked License to Ill. But at the same yeah. time, License to Ill to me is like, I put it in the same boat as like all the Def Jam stuff that it was, you know, it was amongst the, it was the golden era of hip hop. Yeah, you know? for sure. Yeah, they were white dudes. And, you know, maybe the Def Jam guys used that to their advantage. Um, they were like, yeah, now we got this artist that can break our label because they're white. You know, but I don't think the Beastie Boys even thought about that. I think they were just like, we love this music. We're going to make this music. Another thing about the Beastie Boys 
<laughs> I don't think I would have gotten into punk as early as I did had I had this kid Merle Joyner in ninth grade. Merle? His name was Merle <laughs> Joyner. And this was, you know, I, I've already told you where I grew up. And the school I went to when I got out of Catholic school was way out. It was like 20 miles from my parents' house in like the woods. It was like this very, very rural. And this kid Merle was like punk rock metalhead somehow. And and in ninth grade, I, I came in and I had my wa- my Walkman on first day homeroom. And I was listening to Paul's Boutique. He was like, you know, they used to be a punk band, right? And I was like, no, they didn't. <laughs> and, he, and then he didn't say anything else. And then the next day I sat down in homeroom and he slapped Pollywog stew cassette down in front of me. And he was like, listen to this. And I was like, all right. And I brought it home and I was like, holy shit. The Beastie Boys were a hard, not a great hardcore band, but they were a hardcore <laughs> band. And I was just yeah. kind of like, oh my God. All right. And then the Bad Brains thing. And I was like, all right, I got to check out this hardcore thing like i have to at bifocal media the t-shirts how do you marry the artist with the musical artist with the visual artist at the time bifocal was putting out a lot of records this is like eh, late this is early 2000s no actually by the when we started doing the shirts it was like 2009 but we were still putting out a lot of records and we were doing books and we did a book for Brian Walsby, the comic artist, Brian kind of like, Brian was like big, uh, in the letter swapping pen pal era of hardcore in the eighties where that's the only way you found out about stuff was like somebody who lived in California would send you a descendants tape or whatever. And you'd be like, Oh, mm-hmm. and that's kind of how hardcore grew. But, he was really involved in that and he would draw doodles and comics and send them to people. And then he got picked up. He did a lot of stuff in maximum rock and roll. So he became like this underground comic dude. At some point in like 2008, 2009, I'd already published by focal had published a book for Brian full of his comics and it did really well. But, you know, he still worked at like a grocery store and he hated it. And, but one of his best friends was buzz from the Melvins Oh, wow. He just didn't believe that he could make any money with his art or whatever. I didn't have any connections to like these legacy bands like the Melvins and Descendants and all these bands. I was, you know, you know where I grew up. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't <laughs> and all the music at the time that ba- that Bifocal put out was like this chaotic math punk stuff, you know, for the most part. And, um, and that was my scene, you know, um, I was involved in like the the mid nineties living room rock scene, you know, like I was like, Brian, why don't you ask Buzz if we can do a shirt, you do a drawing and I'll lay it out. And I, cause I did shirts for the bands on bifocal. I got them. Okay. I knew how to make shirts. So I told Brian, I was like, you do a shirt with the Melvin, see if Buzz will do it. We'll split the money three ways evenly. and I'll prove to you that you can make money with your art. So we did that and the Melvins posted it on social media and the shirt sold out in like a day. We did 300 of them. Wow. And then, you know, three weeks later when I got, once I had the print invoice paid and everything, I sent Brian and the Melvins each a check for a couple thousand bucks or whatever, you know, and a lot of money in 2009 to someone who worked at a grocery store. And to me, it was a lot of money. (laughs) You know, I ran a, I probably made, maybe 15, 16,000 a year running by focal at the time. So he got the money and he was like, Oh shit. Then like three days later, he was like, Hey man, here's the descendants drawing. They're down. Like not even asking me about it. He was just like, we're doing a descendant shirt. So three weeks later, 2000 bucks. Thanks. Um, that's awesome. But I still wasn't interested in doing shirts, you know, full time. I was putting out records and doing video work. Are you still doing video work? Because I noticed this, the stuff I watch on Vimeo is like 10 years old. Yeah, it's it's all really old. I haven't. You know, the first bifocal release was a video okay. called The Actuality of Thought. Um, it's funny because most of the time when I do podcasts, that's all they want to talk about is that video. But it was. Um, yeah, so I did video work. I don't do it anymore. I took a, I made the mistake of taking a real job running an ad agency for two years, and that 
kind of ruined making movies for me. Really? Yeah. When I left Uh that is when I started doing the um, limited merch thing, like for real, full time. Okay. Um, But yeah, that's how the shirts came about was through Walsby. And when I left the ad agency job, I had a little money saved up because that was a real, my first real job where I got actually got paid for my experience and the fact that I was somewhat talented at at making media. Mm -hmm. So when I left that job, I was like, all right, we're going to try this shirt thing, this merch thing full time. And that's when I started reaching out to other artists, other visual artists. I went, the first thing I did was I went through my record collection, found the covers that really kind of like, were illustrative and that i liked. And then I reached out to the artists that made them because I knew they knew the bands. And, uh, you know, it took like five years for it to really get to the point where it was easy to, to, to get people to trust me. Yeah. And then, but now it's to the point where bands reach out to us, which is very, very cool. (laughs) When you, when, when a band that you, um, are a huge fan of emails you and says, I like what you're doing. Would you want to do a shirt with us? It's pretty, I still like have the like starstruck feeling, you know, it's, it's really, it's fun. On the, on the abandoned albums podcast, a lot of people have asked me, how do you get the artists to come on the show? I'm like, I just ask. Right. You know? Yeah. It's yeah like, people can't believe that like Ian Mackay would want to do your show or whatever. And it's like, yeah, all yeah. you have to do is call discord and he's probably there. You know, like, <laughs> don't do that though. I think we build these these people up because we uh, there are huge figures in our world, you know, our little microcosm of a world, and but they're so accessible that it's well. That's the importance. I mean, that speaks to the importance of music for for. I don't want to speak for you, but for me, I mean, music was a huge part of my life and influenced and informed a lot of the things that I did. Is that the same for you? Is music? Yeah, I mean, yeah. It's yeah. My daughter asked me who my favorite band was the other day, like my twelve-year-old, and I was just kind of like, "Oof, that's a tough one," you know. Like, <laughs> it's it's asking that question of someone who's entire my career, my friends, my social life, um, my politics, my diet. I mean, so much of it comes from music. You know, so yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's, 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 I, I wouldn't be any, I wouldn't be this person without uh, mm-hmm. music, outsider music. What did you tell her? Who was your favorite band? Uh, I had a list. I had a big list. Okay. I just, yeah. Like, you know, because, because I, I play all this stuff for them. I would drive them to school every morning and I play all this stuff for them, you know, and some of it sticks and some of it, they're just like, nah, <laughs> you know, like. I think uh, they they like um, they like Super Chunks. So I was like, Super Chunks, one of my favorite bands. Um, I was like, they like Beastie Boys. So I was like, Beastie Boys are one of my favorite bands. Yeah. Um, you know, stuff like that. Stuff they knew is what I I didn't. There's no point in me like spouting off a bunch of sure. 90s freak out music that they're they hate anyway <laughs> so. people ask me the same question like who's my favorite band and for me it's always the same answer but it can change on any given day but it's always the replacements because that's yes. a solid go-to christopher mars who was the drummer for the replacements for those who don't know is also a visual artist and i was pleased to see t-shirts on the bifocal site of his artwork even though i find his artwork a little peculiar <laughs> disturbing so <laughs> disturbing would be a more accurate word he's a big artist um, though like gallery yeah. level like like that's what he does you know he's i'd love to get a christopher mars piece but save is that huh? <laughs> yeah you're right save your money <laughs> yeah how did you how did you get him um Tom Hazelmeyer from amphetamine reptile records who i do a ton of shirts with he is friends with chris and Chris's wife, Sally Mars, they have a dog rescue called Mutt Mutt Engine, where they find these dogs that are sick or deformed or homeless or whatever. And they, they, pl- they find, they place them with uh, people who want them. And it's kind of like this mission of theirs to save these dogs. 
they and and Mutt Mutt Engine needed shirts, so he asked me if I'd be interested in helping them get shirts. And that's how I hooked up with Chris because I did the Mutt Mutt shirt, and they're just so easy to work with. And then, but Chris didn't want to do shirts because he hadn't found anyone who could translate the uh, paintings to print on a shirt. Eventually. Um, it came to light that my printer, my print partners, aesthetic print and design in Gainesville that I've worked with since the mid nineties, um, that they could do the separations on these paintings and turn them into really cool screen prints for a shirt. It's eight color process, uh, screen prints like, wow. and Chris, he was like, I finally found somebody who can do this. So let's do it. And that's awesome. We've done a bunch of them since then. One of the one of the videos I watched was the uh, Brantford Marcellus Marcellus documentary. How does jazz factor into your musical? It doesn't really. Likes. Okay, I don't. Yeah. I do appreciate like Coltrane, and I haven't. I just don't. I haven't delved into it. <laughs> I mean, uh, when I hear something I like, I put it on a playlist. The Brantford thing came from the owner of Brantford's label or the, the manager of Brantford's label being familiar with my work and asking me to document the recording of a couple Brantford albums. Um, so at the time Brantford lived in, or I think he still does. He lived in Durham, North Carolina, which, and I lived in Raleigh. This was after the tonight show. He, he was the leader of the tonight show band with Jay Leno. And when we left that, he moved to, I think, to Durham from L.A. and started teaching at the college. And somehow, I, and then Brantford and I somehow got along. And so we nerded out over music. I didn't realize Brantford plays the sax on Fight the Power. I didn't know that. Public Enemy. Yeah. And so, wow. so once, I, once he, he would come to my office when we were editing that video you're talking about. And um, I think I had a, I had a, I had a, um, a Chuck D uh, piece of art from Shepard Ferry, and it was signed by Chuck D and Shepard, and it was on the wall of my office. And uh, he saw that, and he was like, oh, "I know those dudes," and he just he's a, you know, he's a talker, you know. So, so we just nerded out and drank wine in my office and talked about hip hop, and I played stuff for him that, you know. I played stuff from like the mid nineties indie hip hop era that I knew he might not have heard. And he, he told me all the stuff he played on, which was an expansive list of stuff. A lot of those sax loops you hear and, and like late eighties, early nineties hip hop, he played. So it was pretty cool. But when I, when I found out he played the, the sax on fight the power, I was like, Oh, this dude's awesome. Bifocal Media Today, I'm looking at the website right now. You do the T-shirts, which are very cool. Sarah Shook and the Disarmers, um, love them. A uh, guy up here named Gorman Bouchard did a documentary on them. He's done a bunch of documentaries. Um, if, you've, if you haven't seen his work, he's done a lot of music documentaries, including the only one on the replacements to date. Oh, cool. Oh, he did, yeah. he did a Sarah Shook one? Yeah, okay. he did. Yeah, she's. Um, I I was introduced to her through an a visual artist who wanted to do a shirt for her. Alexis Price, I think, reached out. Okay. Do you want to do a shirt with this band? She's down to do it, and that's how I found out about um, Sarah Shook and the Disarmers. And she has a solo project, or no, it's not a. She has a, like an indie rock project called Nightmare that we all oh, I didn't know this for. They're on oh. Kill Rock Stars, I think. Oh, wow. Okay. So you do the t-shirts, the record label. Are you still doing video work or is that, are you predominantly just. Don't have time. The and What about the label, the record label? Are you still doing the label? No, no, which is, you know, I have, I've, I have more opportunities now to put out records than I ever have because I have all these connections with these big bands, but. Right. I don't think I could do it right. You know, I don't even think we have uh we don't even have physical distribution anymore. I don't know if that matters. I mean, I don't if think we put out a record, it would just be direct to customer from the website, like all the shirts are. And um 
I don't know. I just haven't had the, I don't have the manpower for it. It's pretty much just me in the office at this point. Wow. Like I delegate work out like shipping. A lot of it gets done from my printer and the printing gets done, you know, there too, obviously. Sure. Um, but other than that, it's just me at this point. That's an awful lot, man. Yeah. Especially with the skateboards and the, the skateboard. We do a lot of skateboards now. So, Oh, the decks? Yeah. Do you still skateboard? No. I take the BMX out every now and then. But I don't have the ankles or the knees for skateboarding anymore. I was never a big skateboarder. Like, I could learn the tricks. But I was always uh, always. I was all, I, I kind of like had a foot in on the BMX thing. Like I had friends that were big pros. Um, so I was always around it. So I just stuck with it more than I never, I never, I don't think I ever went out and said, I'm just going to go skate today. When I skated, it was like, cause this, my skater buddies came over and my little brother's board was there, but you know, I, <laughs> like I could, I learned, I know I could drop in and pump the ramp and, I, le- I think in the in the mid nineties I learned like kick flips and heel flips and stuff, but I never that was never like my scene. F- I loved it. I loved the culture and the videos and everything. Um, but I was I gravitated more toward the BMX. Let's tackle your playlist. You start off with "Don't Bother Me." Why did we kick it off with that one? Uh, for because I think that if if I think they were like the one the band that got me into hardcore, mm-hmm. and um, that track is somewhat obscure. It's a demo track from the Black Dots, which was recorded in 1979. <laughs> wow, it's a weird song. Um, it's not one of the Bad Brain songs that you know. It's not like Pay to Come or. Uh, band in dc it's not one of the ones that's always on um and it's got a cool bounce to it and it's just i don't know it's it's got this outsider feel to it like i don't know if those guys ever felt like they fed in fit in with the music industry or punk rock at all i just think they stayed an outsider they're still 
kind of like, what the hell are those guys up to? You know, like they're still an outsider band. Yeah. Um, and um, I like that, you know. <laughs> and then the Beastie Boys. <laughs> the tracks that are on paul's boutique why did you pick the sounds of science science i think that's the first song i actually heard from that record like i remember buying the record this is when cds still came in the long (laughs) case thing and i got it on cd and this kid jason harrison who was older than me who had his license he was like the king bmx guy in my little town he and I were driving to a contest. I can't remember. I think it was in Greensboro, North Carolina. And we put it in. And that song, or it starts out so weird. You know, like, it's just like, it almost gets annoying. Because you're like, what the fuck is this? And then it just comes in with this, like, pounding boom bap. I think it's like the drums are Beatles sample. <laughs> With Ringo Starr drums and and the guitar part is from the Beatles too, and and it was just like this rapid fire like boom bap weird like you just couldn't it was just like at you you know like it had it was it was good <laughs> and and and, it, and and I don't know it, it had like that eighties like. Um, boom bap feel to it but it was weird you know and the lyrics I mean I printed it out like some of the lyrics 
Ponce de Leon, constantly on, the fountain of youth, not Robotron. Peace is a word I've heard before, so move and move and move upon the dance floor. It's like, what? What? And this is, and, and those lines are sung by three different individuals, or rapped by three different dudes over the course of like six seconds, you know, like, what the fuck? Um, I've got science for any occasion, postulating theorems, formulating equations. We'll teach wizard in a snow blizzard, eating chicken gizzards with a girl named Lizzie. What? <laughs> Why? This record is so lyrically dense. Yeah. And filled with all these pop culture and punk and weird underground references that, I mean, lyrically, it samples just as much as it does sonically, I think. It's just like, I remember reading these lyrics, which were tiny in the liner notes, and just being like, look, trying to find what they were talking about, you know, like, what do they mean? Like, what is Robotron? And every song is that way. It does not let up. And from there, we hop into Search by the Minutemen. So I think search. I knew the I knew fire hose from oh, wow. the fire um, skate video, which was like late eighties, I think. When I first heard search, my friend Jay, who later became who was one of the original owners of Bifocal. So my friend Jay made me a comp tape in like eighth or ninth, maybe even tenth grade, and Search was the first song on the t- comp tape. And I remember thinking it was Fire Hose, but it wasn't. And um somehow I didn't know the Minutemen yet. This was like ninety one, I think. And uh and then from there I was just like, Oh my god, Minutemen. You know, I became obsessed with Minutemen. Um I like the bounce of that song. I like how short it is. Like it leaves you wanting more. It's, I think Watt sings that song. I liked that, how like complex it was, how bouncy it was and how much energy there was in that short little burst of space, which I think is kind of like the point of the Minutemen, you know, like look at all this good stuff in this one song. Okay. It's over. Here's the next song. You know, you never get bored with their, with that stuff. And that song in particular just is really catchy. I also like the idea of the the lyrics of the song. It's kind of like looking inside yourself and um, sorting your own issues out um, and um, figuring out who you are, you know? I'm a couple years older than you are, and I had a friend of mine in high school. I grew up in Dayton, Ohio, and I, I've always been kind of a, a music – not always. I've been a music nerd, but my tastes were – frankly basic i mean i grew up with a lot of kansas sticks that sort of stuff that was played on the radio that's just what i knew i didn't become aware of college radio until probably 83 or 84 and i had a friend of mine in high school who was very into hardcore and she tried like hell to get me into it and i'm like i i was i was such a snob i wouldn't open my mind to it and it's I, I shudder to think at the the opportunities I missed at seeing some of these bands, and but I'm glad I discovered the music even later in life. But yeah, I was lucky enough to be about an hour from Chapel Hill. Oh wow! So uh, I saw a lot of this stuff at the Cat's Cradle when I was a kid, and there was a huge music scene there. So by the time yeah, by the time I kind of like started riding the new wave or whatever, like it was all around me, you know. So Fugazi, Jesus Lizard, yeah. Firehose, all that stuff. Super Chunk was all like always around to go see, sneak into the shows when you're like 15 even, you know? 
Cat's Cradle okay. was a, like they had three locations, and I think the second location oh. was maybe held like four hundred people, and that's where I saw most of the mind blowing stuff. You know, the Fugazi shows and the Super Chunk and you know Jesus Lizard and oh god, so many, so many cool bands. I think I think all three locations were within a mile of each other. Two miles. You're speaking in the past tense. Is it no longer it's, around? No, it's still there. Okay. We just started a, a series of um, of venue T-shirts, like we did the Black Cat shirt for DC. Nice. And um, nice. Um, my hope is that Frank, if you're if you by some weird chance see this, Frank, let's do a Cat's Cradle shirt. If I if I ever have time to seek out new stuff again, that'll be something I try to do. Next up after search by Minutemen is My Philosophy by Boogie Down Productions. So you're a philosopher? Yes. 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 I think very deeply. I think very deeply. I think very deeply. I think I think I think very deeply. In about four seconds, a teacher will begin to speak. I think very deeply. Let us begin. What, where, why, or when? We'll all be explained like instructions to a game. See, I'm not insane. In fact, I'm kind of rational. rational. When I'm asking you, who is more dramatic than this one or that one? The white one or the black one? The punk and I'll jump up to attack one. The one is just the gotta lead a crew. Right up to your face and diss you. Everyone saw me on the last album cover. Holding a pistol, something far from a lover. Beside my brother, S-C-O-T-T. I just laugh, cause no one can defeat me. This is lecture number two, my philosophy. Number one was poetry, you know it's me. You know it's my philosophy. Many artists gotta learn. I'm not flammable, I don't burn. So please stop burning and learn to earn respect. Cause that's just what K.R. K.R. See, what do you expect when you rhyme like a soft punk? You walk down the street and get jumped. You gotta have style. From the Bronx is thick in real, real life. We roll correctly. A lot of suckers will like to forget me, but they can't. Cause like a champ, I have got a record of knocking out the frauds in a second. On the mic, on the mic, that you should get loose. I haven't come to tell you I got juice. I just produce, create, innovate on a higher level. I'll be back, but for now, just settle. For seconds, a teacher will begin to say. I play the nine and you play the target. You all know my name, so I guess I'll just start it. Or should I say start this? Start teacher, this. I'm an artist. Start Art and new artist. concepts in their hardest. Yo, cause I'm Yo. a teacher. Yo. This guy is a scholar. It ain't about money, cause we all make dollars. That's why I walk with my head up. When I hear whack rhymes, I get fed up. Rappers like a setup. A lot of games. A lot of suckers with colorful names. I'm I'm this, I'm that, huh. but they all just wick, wick, whack, wick, whack. I'm not white or red or black, I'm brown. From the boogie down, productions, of course, I'm music be thumping. Others say they're bad, but they're bugging. Let me show you something now about hip hop, about D nice melody and Scott rock. I get a pen, a pencil, a marker. Mainly what I write is for the average New Yorker. Some MCs be talking and talking, trying to show how. And drug selling, see I'm telling, and teach a real facts. The way some act in rap is kind of whack, and it lacks creativity and intelligence. But they don't care because their company's selling it. It's my philosophy on the industry. Don't bother dissing me, or even wishing we soften, dilute, or commercialize all the lyrics. Because it's about time one of y'all hearing it. And first hand from an intelligent brown man, a vegetarian, no goat or ham, or chicken, or turkey, or hamburger. To me, that's suicide, self-murder. Let's get back murder. to what we call hip-hop and what it meant to DJ Scott DJ Laurent. Scott Laurent. Laurent. You're a philosopher? Yes. I think very deeply. In about I four seconds, the teacher deeply. will begin to speak. How many MCs must get this before somebody this. says don't with Chris? Chris is just Chris. one style out of many. Like a piece. 
piggy bank, this is one penny. My brother's name is Kenny. Kenny. That's Kenny Parker. Kenny. My other brother, I see you. I see you. I see you. Lead our productions is made up of teachers. The lecture is conducted from the mic to the speaker. Who gets weaker, the king or the teacher? It's not about a salary. It's all about reality. 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 Teachers reality. teach and do the world good. Kings just rule and most are never understood. If you were to rule or govern a certain industry, all inside this room right now would be a misery. misery. No one would get along nor sing a song. Cause everyone be singing for the king Am I wrong? Am I wrong? Am I so yo, what's up? It's me again Scholar Rock, KRS, BDP again Many people had the nerve to think that we would end the trend With criminal minded and minded Only ten funky, 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 funky hit records hit records. No more than four minutes and some seconds The competition checks and checks and keeps checking They take the album, take it home and start sweating Why? Well it's simple, to them it's kind of vital Vital To take KRS one title To them I'm like an idol and everybody's wrong, they wanna mention me, or rather mention us, me and Scott LaRock. But they could get bust, get robbed, get dropped. I don't play around, nor do I F around. And you can tell by the bodies that are left around when some clown jumps up to get beat down. Broken down to his very last compound. See how it sound? A little unrational. A lot of MCs like to use the word dramatical. Fresh for 88, you suckers. 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 suckers, suckers, suckers. <laughs> So we talked about that earlier. I don't know. I saw that video before I, you know, they didn't play that stuff on the radio anywhere. Not even on black radio near where I live. They didn't play it. I saw the video on 120 minutes. I was introduced by Fab Five Freddy on Sunday. <laughs> um, and the imagery, like he gets out of the G- of a Jeep at the beginning of it. And he does the whole, most of the first verse acapella. Uh, before like the that beat kicks in and um wow like (laughs) some of the lyrics on this on that song are just mind-blowingly cool especially for 1988 like i'm a teacher and scott is a scholar it ain't about money because we all make dollars that i think nwa uh sampled that song a few times and uh, actually the beastie boys sampled this song in sound at the beginning of sounds of science so wow nice connection yeah the right up to your face and dish you that's from uh that's from my philosophy um oh he talks about vegetarianism in yes a rapper yeah. in 88 it's, it's like uh the way some act and rap is kind of whacked it lacks creativity and intelligence but they don't care because their company is selling it it's my philosophy on the industry don't bother just to me or even wishing we'd soften dilute or commercialize all the lyrics it's about time one of y'all hear it. Hear it firsthand from an intelligent brown man. A vegetarian, don't go for ham or chicken or turkey or hamburger because to me that's suicide, self-murder. Like, wow. what? Like, where's that coming from in 1988? Such a trailblazer. Yeah. And that, that I saw them at uh, Cat's Cradle, actually. And really? It was like one of the – that's the only show I ever left and I couldn't speak because my voice was so hoarse. From shouting out, shouting out like every lyric. My brother Stephen and I went, and it was just no. We were on the way home, like yeah, that was so good, <laughs> so good. Like they had, they had people spray painting graffiti behind them while they were playing. They had like um, break dancers on stage. They had like one of the original DJs from the eighties fucking behind them, like spinning all the tracks. It was fucking intense, dude. It was wow. so good. One of the best shows I've ever seen. But yeah, that's why I chose that one because it, it 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 was a it was a milestone. <laughs> it was a it was a big deal for me to, to hear that song. And then bronze, the ladder back. All right, so the ladder back. Full disclosure is a bifocal. Was all three of the ladder backs records came out on bifocal? Oh, we skipped malignous youth. Am I saying that right? Yeah, you said it right. Okay. Did you hear that song? You, I didn't. I couldn't. I didn't get a chance to update it before you. After you sent this. <laughs> Let's go to the 
I feel like I'm gonna lose my grip. That's from their first LP, um, More To It. It was really hard to pick a song from that record because it's so, it's kind of like Paul's Boutique. It's just like, there's no filler on that record. They're from uh, Sierra Vista, Arizona. I think they formed in like 87, 88. And they were, they were in like a bubble. Like, I don't know what they were, where they came up with any of this. They're a weird band. Very, very, <laughs> very, very fast with two vocalists that do these crazy interweaving harmonies. Um, to, to, to give you, to put it into perspective, they did Missa Brevis, they did like a Catholic mass in Latin in like thrash style at some point and just put it out like in Latin, like with all the vocal harmonies and, and like your, uh, I don't know. That's intense. You're That's a weird band dude. And, and I don't think they give a shit about any of like what anybody thinks. I mean, they did a fucking, Catholic. well, obviously they did a Catholic mass in Latin, <laughs> um, but that more to it record is like, the songs are fast as fuck. They're weird. They're catchy. There's no like yelling. Like the two singers can really sing and they sing together. Um, there's a they they did a reunion thing a few years ago where they played shows in Arizona. I maybe just watch that because when you see it live, you're just like, dude. It's funny when music takes you to that point where the only thing you can say is, dude. <laughs> dude. Well, well, I mean, yeah, they're they're a weird band. I think at one point they were offered some epitaph deal or something like mm-hmm. for. This is before – this is when Epitaph was just like bad religion and this is before like they, they broke or whatever. Um, right. Uh, and I, I don't know what happened. Like they turned it down or something <laughs> stupid like that. I, I don't know. I still am in, in contact with the, the front – the guitar player, songwriter guy, James, quite a bit. Oh, cool. Like we've done a couple of Malignus Youth shirts. So? But like I – you just have to hear it. It's I don't even know how to describe it. I'm not Catholic, uh, but I'm so intrigued by this Catholic mass in Latin. Yeah, it's called Missa Brevis. I don't think it's on. Uh, I think the live songs from their they put out a double LP from the from the uh, reunion show. It's on that live, but I would suggest just going on YouTube and finding it, listening to it all the way through. Um, listen to that first before you even dig into the um, more to it LP because. Dude, it's, it's so interesting. It's 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 so fast and so catchy. Uh, we'll move along to the latter back, which is a bifocal band, as you were saying. Recently found, always accepted, but never pursued. All 
Jay, my one of my oldest friends, close high school friend, he was the front guy for the ladder back. That song Bronze is from their third full length. Uh, that did come out on Bifocal. I think it was 2001. Um, those guys were also kind of in a bubble. I mean, they were formed in Eastern North Carolina. And um, I mean, very, very disturbing, dark lyrics, um, screams, yelled, and but then sung kind of chaos meets melody sort of band. Oh, okay. Um, kind of a mid 90s theme. I remember when it came out, um, those guys never toured too much. They did do their last tour was in Japan and every show was sold out. I don't know if that tells you anything. It tells me that Japan has a much broader taste in music. I was just talking to somebody earlier this week who, uh, the Bad Marys, actually, who, um, same thing. Huge. I mean, I, it sounds like a cliche, and I don't mean it to, but huge in Japan. Exactly. Like, we didn't know either. Like, the guy, the promoter paid to bring us. I went with him on the tour. And uh, at the time, my friend worked. We shipped a ton of merch over, let's just say that. And um, it all sold, which blew my mind because we were like we're just gonna have to find a distributor to take this stuff because we're not gonna fly back with it and um every show was sold out every single record and cd we brought sold uh kids who couldn't speak english knew all the words to the songs Uh, and this is not like easy listening music you know like so we were just kind of like and jay um met a woman face to face for the first time while we were there on that tour and then, like three months later, I think he moved to Japan and married her, and he still lives in Japan. It's been like over twenty years. Still married to the same woman? No, different woman. Okay, okay. Well. <laughs> but he's still in Japan. Like he's Jap. He lives in. He's Japanese pretty much now. Um, learned the language. And, uh, he's actually in a new band called Fever Moon, and that like his new records full of big indie stars, like Mike Watts on his new record. Wow. Um, Mario, Mario Rubicala from uh, Hot Snakes and um, um, Click Attack of Katawi and or not Hot Snakes. Yeah, Hot Snakes and All. He was in All for a while. Okay. Um, he's on the record. Chris Broach from Braid is on the record. It's just like jam packed with people. So, um, but yeah, that band, uh, I mean, I think if they would have toured a lot, and, and stayed together. If Jay had moved to Japan, I think they would have gotten the recognition that people who can write songs like that deserve. Um, but you know, it's pretty typical for that to happen. The heart, the heart wants what the heart wants. Right. Right. Well, you know, he was like, a you know, George Bush was in office and he wasn't too, he wasn't really feeling it. <laughs> so he split. plenty of reasons. Plus to leave. He's obsessed with Japanese culture. So, he, he wasn't scared. He just did it. He just moved to Japan. That takes a serious set of ads. Yeah. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, you know, I, I contemplate moving to Canada and that's about as far as I can get. I did it for a little while. In the- did you really? I moved there to work on a movie for like, Oh, okay. I moved back. My friend Brad moved to LA and I didn't want to move to LA. Did you study film? Uh, no, I studied design and okay. media production, like the technical side of it. I didn't study okay. the art side of it. What film was it, if you don't? That one was, it was the Braid Killing a Camera film, which is a documentary about the band Braid from Chicago. Very cool. Next up is His Hero is Gone, Like Weeds. So do you know His Hero is Gone? No. Okay, they're no like um, mid-90s hardcore band. They're probably my, my favorite. Them and Born Against are probably like my favorite mid-90s hardcore bands kind of crusty but they wrote these songs that were like i don't know these soaring atmospheric brutal pounding hardcore songs like with very very leftist political lyrics um but i remember uh jay was actually with me on this trip we went to columbus ohio sorry (laughs) to well there was a festival there in the 90s called the more the music festival Pretty much all the big biggest bands in the of the nineties, like whatever living room rock scene played it. Like there, there was a few thousand people at this festival, but uh, his hero is gone played and like 
like the guy came out and it's just like these four dreadlocked fucking crusty looking dudes, you know, and the singer, like everything was quiet. It was a big, for some reason they had it this year in a big venue. Like the stage was like five, six feet tall. And he just got up there and he like let out this diet, like, released this diatribe of anti-technology rhetoric. And, uh, and I think he is like, are, is big brother watching you or are you watching big brother? And then they launched into that, this, that song. And I just remember like, I don't I, like, you know, like when you see a performance and you're just overcome with emotion, mm-hmm. like, and you, yes. don't, you don't want to, it was like that. Like I just had chills from head to toe. And I remember being like, yeah, this is my favorite hardcore band <laughs> you know like and, and i think they're very beloved band folklore and all kinds of kooky shit surrounding them but um yeah that song that's i think that's the first song on their uh it's the first song on their monuments to thieves lp which is their second full length i think and they went on to a bunch of other big crusty bands after that <laughs> But uh, the His Hero Is Gone is like the one that's like the perfect melding of like chaos and melody. Hmm. That's a recurring theme you've mentioned a couple of times in our discussion, the chaos and melody. There's a lot of chaos. Right. Like 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 somehow the um, I don't think any of these bands intended it, but somehow the fury and the um, somehow the way they recorded the songs there are noises in there where I can't tell what's making the noise, you know, like, is that bass? Is that, is that a keyboard? And that, but it's like, it's just the only word I can think of to describe it is soaring. You know, have you ever worked at a restaurant? Um, yes. I always tell folks that a good restaurant is nothing more than organized chaos. Oh, right. You know, it's like a well-oiled machine because you've got so many different factors in a full-service restaurant. You've got your wait staff, you've got your busters, you've got your bartender, you've got your kitchen. And, and if everything's moving, outside looking in, it can look kind of chaotic, but everyone's doing their part, mm-hmm. and it's it's organized chaos. Look up, If you look up some um, – there's tons of video. I think the ladder back has a lot of video of them playing live, too. But his or was gone. There's a shit ton of video of them playing, so you can kind of get the idea from that. Starts out with mm-hmm. a pretty guitar, but there's this foreboding, and then it launches into like it's like getting it's like being on the firing range, and everyone that's shooting at you has an automatic weapon. It's like oh, it's wow. like flying like Mach three, like Superman style, and you don't have a plane around you, but <laughs> you know like. That's great analogy what it feels like when you when you hear that stuff
Uh, Desk Arc, the subtleties of chores and unlocked doors. Now, I really liked this. This took me by surprise. A lot of de- and there's a lot of Desert Arc songs too, and they're all that good. songwriter and front woman from uh, i think she just started playing again recently the first desert uh full length was on bifocal full disclosure um this is not this that song is from the love it release split split lp with uh ben davis um is on the other side um but uh, she's another kind of like music outsider that's why she stopped she just she's one of the best songwriters i've ever heard 
she's one of the best performers I've ever seen. Wow. And that's another band. Like if you saw that band, there's like folklore. <laughs> you know, there's like people love Desarc. Um, not only because of the songs, but because of the way they performed. That song in particular is real. Not all their songs are like that. That's kind of a country song, you know. Um, a lot of their songs are more abrasive punk type stuff, but still like weird blues uh, kind of influenced, uh, folksy, but 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 more um, distorted and angular. That song's gorgeous, though. So. Yeah, it really. It's is. like a song about alienation, and to me, yep. It's like a queer love song. It's like, um, I don't know. I mean, that girl should have been a star, but she doesn't want to be. She does not want to have anything to do with like music industry stuff. I tried, you know, I put out her first record. I I, I was like, we're going to sell a million of these. They don't want to play that game, <laughs> you know, which cool. You know, the lyrics to that song really like moved me when I first heard it. Um and it was just one song on a split LP that came out later, you know, much later than I was involved with putting out music for, for her. I, I've, I've printed out the lyrics to that one. <clears throat> I figured if we could settle for this drag of a town, if we could settle for friends who ain't around, if we could settle for disappointment, then we could learn to settle for this. And she's talking yeah. about a relationship, you know, like, oh, my God. It's gutting. The first, yeah, the first line of the song, I've been hanging with this girl and she wanted to date. I liked her just fine, but boy, I love to fuck her. That's the first line of the song. This is a pretty song. You know, this is a ballad. Yeah. <laughs> it's like tremendous. The last line of the song, we can lie to our friends, call in sick or whatever, but so long as we suffer apart from one another, you can hold my hand, but you can never hold my heart. Oh, dude. That's like every woman I ever dated. Yeah. That song <laughs> could be the way it is. It could play in the morning on the, the pop radio station that if they played it one time, she'd be a superstar. Everybody who heard that song would love. It. Yeah. And actually, as I heard you read the lyrics, I had like a, it's very cinematic. Yeah. I had solid images in my head. Well, she describes in the second verse um, about, a guy that she uh, that she's friends with or whatever that sneaks into her bed late at night and they don't fuck they don't even speak he just wraps me in his arms real tight and when he breathes on the back of my deck and when he brushes my skin by accident oh lord it feels good to have my patience back it's just like you can like i just feel like i like i've been there you know like not not with her <laughs> right right <laughs> but, but you know it just feels like the in it like it just feels like um the wonder of this like not quite like a relationship or i don't i don't know you when you hear the song you can feel the feel the emotion. it's the beauty of good songs it's like the universality of it regardless of what your sexual preference is regardless of anything we've we've all been in a well not all of us but many of us have been in a similar set of circumstances i, I feel like if she sees this she's going to be like no you you're dipshit charles but, but like <laughs> <laughs> But but it's I don't know that that song in particular, all her songs are this good. Let's go to the Wimple Winch. OK, save my soul.
know this one? I don't know. Th- th- a lot of this was, I would say, out of the Tenton songs, solid six. I had no idea. Okay, good. That's cool. I wasn't yeah. trying to do that. I was actually feeling like I was putting together a list of cliches, a lot of them, other than the songs that were like, anyway. So so that song's from 1966, believe it or not. Really? hmm More like kind of outsider music. They were, they were, I think Wimple Winch formed in like 63. I think they had another name, but they were kind of the pre punk stuff. Uh, I love the idea of punk before punk. Mm -hmm. All the elements are there, the attitude's there, the sound is even there. Um, that song I first heard on the Nuggets compilation. Are you familiar with those? I am, yeah. Um, the second one I think was like songs from outside the US, and they were a Manchester band. Um, that's where I heard that song for the first time. Um, it kind of unfolds in like these weird chapters, you know, like it starts out kind of like with this mysterious guitar and weird lyrics. And then it kind of, it kind of builds and builds into like, well, and kind of, kind of builds into chaos, you know, it's, um, it's, it's dudes making punk rock music in the, in the mid sixties. It's interesting to think about, these bands that were doing things before, again, we talked about it earlier, these bands that were doing things that didn't exist prior to them, mm-hmm. you know, they pulled these things down and created something new. There's this whole world of outsider music that I, yeah, that encompasses a lot of different genres, but it's interesting. I mean, I feel like a lot of music, these bands start and they're like, we're a punk band. We're a country band. We're hip hop. Like, I like the idea of these bands that didn't have that, like, or they were shooting for something and they totally missed the mark and created something amazing and new in their folly. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. like bands like Wimple Winch and uh, I feel like that's what happened with Bad Brains. I think Bad Brains thought they were they sounded like the Sex Pistols, you know, <laughs> but they did not sound like the Sex Pistols, you know. And then the last one we got is Goat. Fill my mouth. Now, this is my fir- favorite band for real at the moment. Okay. Do you know do you know Goat? Do not. Oh my god. So I, I don't think they're a small band. I think that they just play huge festivals and stuff. They don't play like uh they're very popular, I think, right now. But uh there's so much folklore and mystery surrounding this band. Nobody even knows who's in the band. They do, uh-huh. they wear masks, all these like voodoo type tribal masks. They're from they are from Sweden, but they have like this whole like line of like like they're from, I can't even, they're from Korpalumbalo, Sweden is what they say. And they say that it's, um, the band has been going on for like, you know, decades. It's just tribes people and village people who get together and play music. I mean, they're on sub pop. Um, their line is that they, uh, the only reason they have songs is because they were given the opportunity to record. So they had to like put these songs into a form that they could record. There's two female front women who, who sing and it's kind of like this chanted, almost like um, the song, the vocal approach is kind of like, I don't know, kind of like a, a chant sort of almost, but um, the songs are just so like, they just, lure you in they're very very cool band this song in particular (laughs) there's a nice flute solo in this song well the flute you can't go wrong with the flute solo very dirty nasty flute solo in this song and this song is kind of a departure from most of their stuff but but they kind of have like this witch sort of vibe to them actually you know who just did a thing on them is the levitation sessions do you know them they do these video they they take these bands to weird places and they record a live performance with just the band. And then they release an LP to go with the video. That's fucking brilliant. And, and it's, it's fucking awesome. But, but you, you get a pretty good idea of what they're all about.
it's like eight people on stage all wearing these elaborate like costumes. You can't tell who anybody is. I don't think anybody in the press has even cracked who's in the band. There's a band that I'm into right now uh, called Glass Beams from Australia, and they're an instrumental band. It's just three people, and they've got a heavy Indian influence. It's, you know, guitar, bass, and drums, no vocals. And they wear, like, these beaded masks. It's got, like, a sitar sound to it. They're just phenomenal. And it's hypnotizing. It's mesmerizing. It's That's what goats like. <laughs> the mask is, like, such an interesting thing. I, I remember reading a few years ago about I think it was an interview with Paul Stanley. He said one of the things that we liked about the face paint is that feasibly kiss could go on forever. Right. It could be anybody. I think that's what these guys do. I think that's part of the plan. I think there's probably like the, there's probably like three or four central characters in the band and they just rotate, but I don't know. Nobody does, I guess. Um, but that song is also, that song is a departure because the lyrics are all about fucking you know, it's just a, a sex. You don't say. Yeah, it's a sex song. Which, no, it's 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 a sexy song. It's very cool. <laughs> it's just... you got the lyrics there. Let's hear some. All right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, going south, I really need something inside my mouth. I mean, the song is called "Fill My Mouth." <laughs> I'll just read. I don't know. If, I just printed the lyrics off some lyric site, so the lyrics might be wrong. But um. When I get started, I can never stop. Pressure drop. It'd be nice if I could stir it up. Blow me out. If you can work it, I'll scream and shout. Going south, I really need something inside my mouth. Sung by two women at once over this, like, crazy, like, bouncy, like, tribal jam. (laughs) That's Uh, amazing. You've got me moving like the living dead. Don't leave me hanging with my legs spread. <laughs> Not all their stuff's like that. Most of it's just like this groovy, like, um, nature, naturalistic, like, voodoo vibe of, like, I just imagine, like, a cult of people living in the woods, performing sacrifices and rituals and chanting when I hear this band. But very, 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 very catchy. Charles, I've taken up so much of your time. I appreciate you giving me the time. This is exactly what I want it to be. I mean, you, you describe these songs perfectly. Oh, cool. Good. And um, hopefully the artists don't get angry with me for <laughs> mutilating the meaning of their songs. <laughs> I don't see how they could. I mean, like I said, so many of these bands I had never heard of. So cool. Raise awareness. That's what it's all about. Yeah. Thank you for the time. I, I, I think what you do is great. I really do. I love the T-shirts. Um, I'm not just going to smoke up your ass. Thanks for noticing. Yeah, no, I think that I went through all 24, 25 pages. That's a lot. Yep. You know more about it than I do at this point. It's uh, I'm trying to get the skateboards are kind of exciting to me right now because it's kind of like a piece of art that, yeah. that you can afford by these big artists. And there's a band tied in. And nobody's skateboarding on a hundred dollar limited edition signed skateboard but it's it's a lot more fun to me than doing prints you know and people try to get me to do art prints forever so and you you have no interest to do not like really. posters or I, you know the idea of having to ship roll up and ship posters is i'll leave that to the artist <laughs> for now <laughs> well listen man uh thank you enjoy your friday i appreciate it i'm gonna edit this thanks I'll 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 uh I'll post it on our stuff. To let awesome. Know. I dig it. And I'm gonna go ahead and hit end. Mix and match was written and produced by Keith R. Higgins. It was recorded at Thunder Love Studio where it was engineered by Tony Jackson and mixed by Diane Coughlin. A new episode drops every Monday night. Thanks for listening. <laughs>